and welcome to the latest edition of Infection Control Matters. And um, we've got Martin with me here at Avondale University. Hey, yeah. Martin. Great pleasure to be here. Great. Thank you. And uh, we've got uh, Professor Maria Northcote uh, with us as well. Good day, Maria. Hi, Brett. Hi, Martin. Good to see you, Professor. We've done one of these, um, I think, some time ago, about qualitative research. It was, yeah. 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 But, um, and today we're going to talk about a study that you presented at the SIPSI conference. Yeah. And it was about patients' perspectives of getting a healthcare-associated infection. Not much been done in this area in the past, has there? No, we found, as you know, as a, from our team's perspective, like we, we looked at their experience, and then we looked at the literature, and then we thought, well, there's, there's a bit of a gap there. Like there. It's not completely empty, but it's definitely an under-researched area, the patient's mm. perspective. Mm. of um, going through the experience of having a healthcare-associated infection and then dealing with it and how it affects not just them but their families and their lives afterwards. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering what prompted the study. So it was actually the experiences of, of people that made you think, actually, this is an, an area we should look at. Yeah, and I think from, um, from my personal perspective of a qualitative researcher, well, I tend to do mixed methods and with a bent on, qual- on qualitative and I was really wondering about, well, what, it, what are the patient's experiences? And it seemed like other people in our team had been wondering that as well. Mm. And it just seemed to be a little bit of silence in that area in the literature. Hmm. Yeah. Mm. Originally, I remember, the thing, I remember we, were in a, we used a whiteboard and we started putting That's this right. study out for yeah. years ago. Yeah. The study got interrupted a fair bit because of COVID. Yeah. Um, so the idea behind the study was to, to identify people who've got an infection in hospital and infection control professionals identify those for us in a couple yeah. of different hospitals in Australia. And then um, you followed them up when they were home uh, and interviewed them. Yeah, so me and another interviewer from the team, um, we've both had experience, I suppose, in interviewing people for, from multiple, I suppose, groups and perspectives and contexts. Um, yes, yeah, so when COVID came along, because we were doing phone interviews, it wasn't too interrupted. I mean, the lives of the participants, the patients, they were probably more interrupted than our research met- methodology and methods. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were, the good thing about using the phone, I think, was that we interviewed the people, the participants in the project when they were in their own context. Mm-hmm. So they didn't have to come to us. There wasn't that formality of walking into an institution that they didn't know mm-hmm. or even a room they didn't know. They were in their local environment. Mm-hmm. And often they had um, a husband or a wife or a spouse partner, sometimes they had a son or a relative with them mm. and that that helped them to feel I think more at home and comfortable and mm. just more um, open I think about the whole process. Has anybody yeah. actually looked at the setting that people are in and whether that changes the way they answer as a matter of interest? Um, I think in quantitative research in yeah. general people have. Because I think you would naturally feel that that would be the case. But, yeah, yeah, yeah and mm. I think as a qualitative research you want to go to the participants place if you can or at least mm-hmm. they're someone that they're familiar with and the idea is you should give them choice in the matter mm-hmm. so you're not imposing your structures on them so we contacted them first and said um, you know you still okay to do this and most people except for two said yes mm-hmm. and they had that the people who said no had given consent but for some reason they had a change in their sort of circumstances. Mm. Um, yeah, so they were all um, sitting at home, I'd imagine, mm. in their lounge room mm. or living room or something, or mm. kitchen, and so they were, they were okay with that. Some of them were still a bit nervous, mm. and they might have been of that generation. I don't think we asked them for specific ages, did we? No, we didn't. No. We weren't really interested no. in that. But going by what they said, mm. um, I think most of them would have been over 50, and most of them would have been retired or semi-retired. Okay. Yeah. Uh, was it a range of infections? Yeah. Different yeah. types of infections? Because I've, I've read the old paper that looked at catastrophic effects of surgical site infection where it really impacts physically as well mm. as, as mm. everything else. But you, you had a wider range of infections than that, did yeah, you? Yeah, we did. I think some of them had... Um, well, you, but you know the mm. infections mm. more than I do. Yeah, I think we had a bit of a mixed urine tract yeah. infections and mm. I think we had pneumonia, pneumonia and surgical yeah. site, a couple of bloodstream infections yeah. and wound infections. You never read anything looking at people with bloodstream and urinary tract mm. infections. I have to say, it's mm. most of the ones are sort of focused on you know, have, you know, what's it like having your dressing changed every day and all this sort of thing rather yeah. than... Oh, okay. okay. Mm. Yeah, no, it was, good. it was a good wide ranging. I think the other thing it helped us do is understand how to, to do this type of research a bit better. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
because we plan to do some more of this in future studies and build these into trials yeah. so we can really get the patient's voice heard a bit more. Mm. But mm. I think this has been a really good step to try and learn a lot from, from that and, and think about what would we do differently in future yeah. studies. Okay. But Mia, what do you reckon about, um, what were the key things that you heard them you know, describe yeah. to you as, as their experience? Uh, well, because I was one of the interviewers, I can still hear a couple of the people's voices in my head. You know, they often stay with you. Mm. And one of the big things that we picked up was not just from the people I interviewed, but the other interviewer, Carolyn Rickett, Associate mm. Professor Carolyn Rickett, she interviewed people as well, is this um, almost in, inseparable, the way that it was inseparable, the way they reported on how they felt physically and emotionally or psychologically. So yeah. it's, it seemed like those things couldn't be separated. So even when we asked them how they felt, some of them really just went straight into how I felt emotionally. Mm. I think one person only interpreted that as physically and then we extended that question a little. Mm. Um, but that was one of the biggest things and I was quite surprised at that that they were very aware of how this infection impacted their whole person. Mm. That was one of the big things. Mm. Um, and the other thing we noticed was how it affected their identity. So some of them were talking about um, one woman in particular who saw herself, from what I could, could gather, as quite fit and for an older person. She sounded to me like she was in possibly her 60s or 70s. Mm. And she said the, after having the infection... Um, she said it launched me into old age. She right. felt like she'd gone from sort of middle mm. age, you know, getting towards old age, and she just felt like after that time she was in it. Mm. So she's she's she was almost um, lamenting it. Really, the I mean, change. Yeah. Could she? I, mean, I don't know if you asked the question, but could she see that that as being a recoverable position, or did she think that was likely to be it? Now, that's a good question, Martin. Mm -hmm. Don't really know. But okay. the way she was talking, it sounded like she was on that track now. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. and other people were talking about how it impacted their family life. Like one guy in particular said, when he came home, because he'd, he'd been in hospital for an extended period, his wife had changed routines at home. And she was saying to him, no, this is the way we do things now. <laughs> so he was, he felt yeah. like he was, you know, coming into a different Living yeah, as a place. guest in his own home. Yeah, right? wow. yeah. And I think that one was someone who had an infection and complications there off. That's right. Yeah. yeah, he was yeah. in hospital, I think, for four weeks instead of one week. Mm. Yeah, so those things were particularly important. But the, the, the mm. other thing I, I noticed is, although I couldn't see the people, of course, they were so honoured and they felt quite chuffed to be able to, to be asked. Mm -hmm. And they and they kept, oh, not kept saying it, but quite a few of them were saying, and where's this going and who are you going to tell? And mm -hmm. so when I presented at the conference, I felt like I had a responsibility to report what they were saying. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was really nice to hear them um, quite being quite animated about suggestions about mm -hmm. what nurses, doctors, medical staff could do in the future. Mm -hmm. Do, you, do any of those spring to mind? Any of those sort of... Yeah, yeah. The there are a couple. Um, I'm thinking of, you know, sometimes they felt quite embarrassed about having an infection, especially if it was, if it was related to urinary tract or something mm. like that. Um, and they felt like when people came to visit, they didn't really want them to know. Mm. So even having the catheter bag in view, they used to put a blanket over it. Mm. So uh, I think they wanted their medical staff who were looking after them to really... Be conscious of that mm -hmm. um, and some of them talked about you know the information not getting enough information so mm -hmm. they wanted to know about their health conditions um, and they were very understanding about the nurses and the doctors and everyone that was treating them they said look I know they're really busy but sometimes I think um, in terms of the sequence of their treatment the first person might not have told them about what was going on so mm -hmm. the subsequent medical professionals that came in they just assumed that the patient did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the patient said, oh, I'm trying to piece things together. I think one said they were pasting things together. Mm -hmm. So some of them really didn't feel like they were being heard or listened to. Mm -hmm. And sometimes some of them felt like they knew they had an infection, but no one was taking it seriously. Or mm -hmm. the clinical measurements that were being taken, um, they weren't necessarily, it wasn't looking like they had an infection, mm -hmm. but the patient often said, well, I knew I had one. Mm. Yeah. And no one was listening to me. Yeah, there's a fascinating quote, I think, yeah. in the about that. Yeah. yeah, someone said, oh, any medical staff would know there's a... I'm paraphrasing here, yeah, but yeah. would know that a burning 
feeling of pain behind the wound, that that could be an indication of infection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was important that they felt like sometimes they did know what was going on with them, but it wasn't They couldn't get anyone to listen to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, their relationship, especially with the nursing staff, really, one person said, it got me through. Mm. So that was really important. Mm. Yeah. It's great having, you know, I've worked with Mary on many projects, and it's, Maria's come from an educational, uh, and not yeah. education, but educational background, and the value of having very different um, team members and expertise in, in the team is really valuable because mm. you, you just you sort of take it for granted. Yeah, being a nurse yourself, myself, and having worked as a nurse and worked in infection control and all those sorts of things that yeah. um, it's just an assumption about certain things, and uh, and having a really different perspective mm. is really important, I think, to. Yeah. Just to, to make that holistic view, um, and, and I guess that was been really fascinating. The thing I got out of the study was that it was mm-hmm. really particular things about patients wanting to get their voices heard and yeah. being chuffed and being really happy to be oh, asked. I know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we find in education, and you know how nursing and education often go along this parallel development mm-hmm. in history, and in education, there's a like a movement or a wave in the last probably decade, especially of getting stakeholders more involved. So with primary school children, for example, there's this wave, well, it's been going on for a while, about the negotiated curriculum where you get even really small kids involved with making choices about what are we going to do in the classroom today and what are Mm -hmm. we interested in rather than the teacher setting the standard all the time Mm -hmm. or the topic or the agenda. And we're seeing that also in professional development in universities. Mm -hmm. So rather than the so-called experts developing, say, a workshop program, they're asking the people who attend those workshop programs, so what do you need? Well, that's an idea. Let's yeah, ask them. Well, we were talking about this this morning about <laughs> a future study you know, and actually saying to the people, what would you want to know? Did we actually tell you what you did want to know? Yeah. And what actually did you find interesting in what we told you? Because we tell people what we think they want to know. Exactly. Right. And actually what was missing, you know, what did you really want to know that I didn't tell you? Yeah. Mm. yeah. And we don't do that. No, we just, no. You know, we know what we're doing, and therefore this is what you're getting. And I'm, mm. I think that would make a big change in the way people are prepared to receive information. I think mm. so, and I think mm. it's, you know, in teaching we call it student-centered learning, and in nursing, I've, I've, mm. I've you, you say mm. learn from me. I've learned mm. from you guys mm. as well. You mm. guys call it patient-centered, mm. Mm. <laughs> or in some places, client-centered. Mm. So mm. I think there's that wave that's happening, and that I suppose this project represents a cog in the wheel of that movement. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Because as you said, it's surprising that there's not actually much being done. You know, Kate Curry did a, a review, yes, a review, so and, yeah. and that was actually helped us inform this project um, initially. Yeah, and we saw that there was a gap that no one actually, from our reflection, had done this in this part of the world before. Yeah, but also other states had really focused on particular infections rather than yeah. uh, rather than multiple of the infections. Yeah, and taking a slightly different methodological pr- different yeah. approach. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, one of the things I like, Marine in the conference someone asked so so what does this mean now for future yeah. uh, future work and I craftily handed that question over to you <laughs> yeah, yes. well, that's, uh, we call that a hospital pass yeah. <laughs> what is it a hospital, hospital pass, pass yeah. <laughs> it's, it's when you're about to get the ball and somebody's about to hit you yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah the hospitals involved have used that as part of their education yeah staff great and um, uh, part of their, their way in which they can educate. Mm. Um, actually, one of the hospitals um, did a, a separate piece of work around. They wanted to present some impact of bloodstream infections, and so they had an economic um, discussion in this in this piece of work. And it was an internal poster and piece of work, QI piece of work. But they also then could bring in the quotes and the experience from the patients' oh, side okay. into that. So it was bringing the really holistic. Here's the financial. Here's the data on hand hygiene. Here's the data on your subsidy rates. Um, this is the impact it's having on X, Y, and Z and the costs. And here's the patient perspective. And actually, it's the stories that people remember yeah. like, always. That's right. They do. Yeah, yeah, that's stories. True. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you was, was, was there any feeling of blame from the patients about who yeah. might have caused this infection? Or had they actually had any parts playing it themselves or, you know, did they talk about that at all? That's such a good question, Martin, because the blame, there was a theme, like almost like a common theme going through about this blame issue and we probably didn't dig into it as much as we could have in in terms of the questions. Hmm. But that might be something we look at in future um, 
medical studies to include that in the interview regime. Mm-hmm. But the um, there was definitely blame by some. Although as a whole, the people we interviewed ten people, so on the, on the whole, most of them were pretty understanding, even when they had serious. You know, not close to death experiences. Mm-hmm. They said, "Oh, but they were busy, and they were people worse off than me, and all that sort of thing." Mm-hmm. Um, and that could have been possibly the aid the generation. I'm not sure. Um, but there was also this other issue that sometimes the patients felt like they were to blame right, from okay. the medical professions, but also from um, some of their family members. So they felt like they were so, they were being questioned about, um, you know, what did you do to get this infection? Did you, maybe you didn't wash your hands properly. And there was even a question at the conference from someone, did we ask about what the patients did to prevent? Mm. And I don't think we did ask no, that. No. But that could be another thing to mm. add. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So I mean, it's I, definitely there. You're right about people being understanding, but if you said to them, oh, yeah, well, we've got this bundle in place, but actually probably only 20% of people actually get the whole bundle, the best evidence-based care. Yeah. If they knew that actually there were several things that should have happened that didn't happen, mm. then they might be a bit more keen to go, actually, this is somebody's fault. Mm. But yeah. they'd never know that. Mm. Unless That's you went plowing through the notes mm. to actually say, did you do X, Y, and Z? Mm. And if you didn't, why, why have I got this infection? Mm. But at the moment, they accept that we adopt best evidence-based practice for everybody, yeah. Yeah, which, as we the, know, doesn't happen. Though. Yeah, I can hear one of the patients in my head particularly, she was very concerned about sharing a bathroom with other people who weren't using the bathroom very tidily, mm. put it that way. It was pretty mm. messy. And she said it wasn't being cleaned regularly, so she was expecting to get an infection, and she did. Wow. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's interesting, that's isn't it? Because yeah. another work of yours, nurses don't want to go in a room that was a side mm-hmm. room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because they're worried about picking up an infection, so they're not confident themselves that things are done yeah. right. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, the recruitment um, of these patients happened over a, a, a quite a long period of time from yeah. people with the paper they might know. So that was because... There was COVID in the middle, so we stopped recruiting during that time um, yeah. because there were a lot of priorities for hospitals. Um, uh, but I guess the other challenge for recruitment is having a conversation with someone to say, you have an infection, yeah. and they also want to talk about it. So the first part's actually the hard part, I think. Did they actually know they had an infection, by the way? I mean, yes, did, they did. You, oh, okay. Yes, we made sure that that was part of the... So they'd already knew before office. you turned up yeah. and said, you've yeah. got an infection, because yeah. otherwise that might have been... Uh, that's well. right. Yeah. That's right. So we want to make... And you know, the hospitals took responsibility for that. They recruited so they could have those conversations to start with. Okay. Yeah. And so that would be interesting, how hard were some of those conversations? Because we heard yeah. from some of the patients that didn't know they had an infection mm. at... Initially, initially in their care. Mm. Um, mm. So this conversation about with patients about, by the way, you've got an infection um, acquired here in hospital, is probably not an easy conversation to have. And I wonder, you know, how well, how can we improve that? Now? I mean, I, I think people often say you've got an infection, but mm. they don't add the acquired here in hospital, yeah, yeah, even yeah. though it is it's sort <laughs> yeah. of implicit because then they maybe wouldn't want the discussion about, well, how did I get that here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think from yeah. what the patients were saying, if I'm here as their advocate, mm. they would they definitely want to know the information. Mm. But you know, sometimes when everyone's in such a hurry, the information is delivered. It's not engaged. It's not an interaction. Mm. So I think if well, if they were here sitting around this mm. table, they would probably say, "Yeah, give me the information, but give me a chance to ask questions as well." Yeah. Because mm. otherwise, it's just like the doctor or the nurse or whoever just mm. offloading. And giving them the information like drop and run, and mm. sometimes they feel really stressed and think, "Well, what does this mean for me?" Mm. Or they'd stop listening because their emotions have taken over, thinking, well, "All they can mm. think about is crikey, I've got an infection," and then they mm. don't hear all the other information. Yeah, um, and so. when it's delivered, I mean, if it did, yeah. it's delivered on a ward round in front of four or five people, exactly. there's not much chance to have a chat about that. No, right? no. Yeah. 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 And probably no one then goes back and has that discussion. Probably not. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And so they might be left with. They, the patient might hear a bit of it or none of it yeah. or they might mm. mishear. Or might miss it, yeah. Mm. So even saying to them, you know, giving them a chance to feed it back, like in education when we're testing people that they really have heard what we think they heard, we ask them to paraphrase, even that might be a way. Wow, that's an You know, to yeah. say, so what, what did you hear me say then? Yeah. And sometimes people say stuff and you think, oh, that was not what I said. <laughs> yeah. or, if, or if the nurse were to go back to them after they've been told, just, you know, just yeah, tell yeah. me what you understood yeah, about yeah. that. And like, you know, are there any questions? Yeah, mm. and have that questions. Yeah. Mm. It would be nice. Yeah. yeah. But, but not always time. No. no. I'm guessing. 
Well, it's been great talking to Maria and always like great working with you, of course. Yes, yeah, um, yeah. And uh, look, we've got some more stuff in this area to come. So yeah. um, hopefully we'll get some more of those voices heard. Yeah. Um, and uh, we actually use this as a model to to also engage in the design of some of the studies we've got coming up as well. So Yeah, um, it's mm. an interesting area. There was a lovely lecture there, and I really enjoyed yeah, it. Thank you. So, you know, hopefully your patients... If you can feed back to them that their voices are being heard at yeah. major meetings. And, Actually, that's a good point. And going out live. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, was, I yeah. really should follow that up because I think, yeah. I'm guessing here, eight, nine out of ten mm. asked to, to know about the results. Yeah. Mm. So I think I've still got their phone numbers, mm. maybe email addresses, yeah. so I'll have to talk about how we let them know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. often you find people sue a hospital. Mm. Not because they want the money, it's because mm. actually when they complain it hasn't gone anywhere and they haven't mm. got the information and that's the only way they can get oh. the information. They just don't want somebody else to go through the same thing. Yeah, fair, mm. yeah. Mm. So mm. it's that sort of feeling, at least it may have been bad for me, but I'm contributing to somebody. Yeah, yeah, like an altruistic sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, nice. So if there are any participants from the study who are listening to this, a big thank you um, yeah. from, from us. And um, we hope that uh, it was an experience that you felt worthwhile doing as well and uh, yeah. continue to do it in the future. So, um, yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks very much, Maria. Thanks, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Mm. Really enjoyed Good it. Thank you. And that's uh, a wrap-up from this edition of Infection Control Matters.